Hey everybody, I hope you can hear me out there. We're going to do another live video today talking about a great topic about whether or not the police have to tell you why you're being stopped. There's a really interesting bill that just failed in Virginia. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but this is a nationwide issue that I think no matter where you are, uh, could apply to you. And so we're going to talk about it. Uh, while we get rolling here and let some people come in, we got some already some really great uh, comments. Uh, so we're going to cover, cover a couple of those. Uh, Trend Kilo 254 asks, is this nationwide or Virginia only? Uh, we're going to talk at both levels. Uh, I'm a Virginia attorney. I handle DUI and traffic defense here in Virginia. But a lot of the issues that we cover on the channel are nationwide issues. And frankly, some of the issues could apply even in other countries. But of course, uh, nationwide in the US, we're all governed by the United States federal constitution. Your state can vary on some things and even your local county can vary on some things. This is why you definitely, it pays to know the laws and it also pays to know a good local attorney. I always recommend if you get in trouble, you need a local attorney who knows the court, knows the judge, knows the clerks. Uh, a lot of times that's one of the keys to getting good outcomes. So a lot of our stuff's nationwide, but some is specific only to Virginia. But today we're going to try to talk about both levels. All right. Let's see. So uh, Trend Killer has another great comment. I'm from Texas. I'm from Texas as well. Go Texas. I've always been told, am I being detained or am I free to go? For what reason am I being detained and what crime am I suspected of committing? It's a great question to ask the police. I have some videos on the channel that talk about uh, basically what you should do as far as uh, asking if you're free to leave or if you're being detained to basically sort of force the officer to declare what they're doing. Um, but unfortunately, the officer doesn't have to tell you the reason why you're being detained if you are. Um, so the classic example that I handle in my daily practice uh, you know, with my clients is being stopped for traffic offenses. Um, and when you're stopped for a traffic offense, the officer, frankly, doesn't have to tell you why he's stopping you. The officer pulls you over. He's got to have reasonable, articulable suspicion to pull you over. That's essentially more than a hunch. So there's different levels of burdens of proof from what the officer has to prove. There's basically a hunch, which is way down at the bottom, and a hunch is essentially I, I thought something might be up. Above that is reasonable articulable suspicion. That's the burden of proof for a traffic stop. So what, they, what we call a Terry stop from the Terry versus Ohio case. Um, that applies nationwide. And reasonable articulable suspicion means that they can articulate to a reasonable degree or a reasonable standard uh, that there is some violation of the law being committed. So that's a pretty low low burden. They don't have to prove it, but they have to be able to point to here's X, Y, and Z why I believed a certain violation was being committed, or just in general that criminal activity is afoot uh, is one of the famous for famous phrases. Criminal activity is afoot. Okay, so reasonable articulable suspicion. Then we go one higher level, and that's probable cause. Probable cause essentially means that it's more likely than not that some particular offense is occurring or you know like for example a dui we a lot of times challenge that a client was not validly arrested and so it's, that's a probable cause analysis to argue that uh, on a reasonable standard a reasonable officer knowing what this particular officer knew at the time that he cuffed the client that that was not probable cause so it's not more likely than not that the person was under the influence so probable cause is a higher standard and then of course for criminal law we go to the highest standard of all which is beyond a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt is basically you've taken that football all the way to the end zone. Um, it's clear that there's no reasonable doubt. Now, does beyond a reasonable doubt mean there's no possible doubt at all? Unfortunately not. It doesn't mean we're 100% sure, but it certainly means you're at least at the end zone. You may not have run all the way up into the other side of the stands, uh, but you've got the ball to the end zone and it's very clear that there's no reasonable doubt. A reasonable mind is not going to look at these facts and say, maybe this person didn't do this or this specific crime. But reasonable suspicion, so we have beyond a reasonable doubt, way up here, reasonable suspicion is just more than a hunch. It's a very, very low standard, and that's the standard to pull you over. Um, so let's move on and let's talk about, let's see, we got a couple other questions. Okay, this is a great question to start off the discussion. If the officer does ask you, do you know why I pulled you over? What's the best way to answer? To saying, no, I don't. Frankly, I think the best way to answer is to not say anything. Now, I'll caveat that with, it can depend. <laughs> I'm a lawyer. Uh, there's a book uh, that uh, I studied in law school about how to write good law school uh, essay questions called Getting to Maybe. 
Uh, and essentially, that's what you learn in law school is to pick out this fact and this fact and this fact and say, well, you could argue this, but you could argue this as well. And that's frankly what they teach us as lawyers. So it's hard to give black and white answers to regular folks who want black and white answers. But it does depend. In general, I would not answer that question. In general, if an officer says, you know why I pulled you over, I would say, well, I'm not sure, officer. Uh, can you let me know what's, what, the, what the problem is? Something like that might be a good answer or frankly, no answer at all. Just say, officer, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna answer any questions. Um, and if you say it politely, uh, you're kind of, some officers will say you're getting the stop off on a bad foot and they might've just had a discussion with you, but now they're gonna write you a ticket. But if you say it politely, you're not being a jerk. If you say, well, officer, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I'm not gonna answer that question. Um, please let me know what I can do for you. Uh, if you say it politely, it shouldn't be too bad, too big of a deal. So that's kind of what I would do. Uh, let's see. Here's a good example uh, from M. Christensen about beyond a reasonable doubt. Being caught with a crowbar jammed in the door to a jewelry shop. I agree. Uh, you know, being caught red-handed is certainly way beyond a reasonable doubt. But the, here's the other thing, though. Are we sure that you actually did the crime you're accused of? Sometimes you may be essentially caught red-handed, uh, I have a case pending right now where there's essentially a video that sh allegedly shows what happened, but it's not exactly what the officer's claiming happened. Uh, so it's, there can be fuzzy areas, even if we sort of catch somebody red-handed. Uh, the, the actual alleged crime or offense may not be on paper alleged what we actually see occurred, uh, if that makes sense. So, uh, yeah. And then here. Um, Billy Ray Valentine says, you pulled me over. So could you tell me why you pulled me over? So spit it out, officer. See, that's no offense to Billy, but that's an example where I wouldn't quite go that far. I wouldn't say, well, you pulled me over. Why don't you tell me? Um, if they say, uh, you know, do you know why I pulled you over? I think it's a good time to say, well, officer, I'm not sure. Uh, what can I do for you? Um, something like that, because you don't want to necessarily admit to the offense. All right. And this is a little off topic we're answered anyway, because this is a very common question we get here on the channel. Are you required to roll your window all the way down? Required? Probably not. Um, the law says, essentially, um, in most states, obviously, you got to pull over if you're being pulled over by the police. And the law says in most states that you have to exhibit your license or registration. And we're going to get to that in a minute with this Virginia bill. Um, are you required to roll your window all the way down to do that? I would say no. But keep in mind, I've got a video on the channel we just did a few weeks ago about whether or not you have to exit the vehicle. And under Pennsylvania versus MIMS, it's a Supreme Court case, so it applies to everyone in the United States, um, you do have to exit the vehicle if you're told by the officer. So while MIMS doesn't say you have to roll your window all the way down, it does say the officer can just order you out of the vehicle. So I frankly don't, I don't see what purpose uh, playing games with the window gets you. Uh, essentially, you're kind of asserting your your dominance or your authority. I get that, um, but I don't see what purpose it plays or what uh, purpose it serves to not roll your window all the way down. Um, maybe roll it most of the way down. Maybe so the officer can't put his arm right on the window edge there on the door edge. Um, but frankly, I just wouldn't advise playing games with rolling your window down because they can ask you to just step out, and the law says you have to comply. Here's another good question before we get to the other stuff. Uh, is there a recourse for drug dogs alerting when no drugs were found? No, unfortunately, no. Um, the, the law is pretty terrible on this front, basically. You know, officers can be very wrong um, about the, you know, the, what the officer smell or what the officer think may be there. Uh, dogs can be wrong. And essentially, as long as there was some reasonable belief, uh, probable cause, different standards obviously apply. But as long as they didn't do something that was flat out insane, um, there's not going to be any, um, there's not going to really be any relief. Now I will uh, caveat that with saying that I'm a defense attorney. I help people fight their charges, like their DUI arrests or reckless driving tickets, things like that. I don't do a uh, civil rights lawsuit, like suing the police, uh, you know, on behalf of people who have been wronged. Uh, some people certainly are wronged. Property is damaged. Jobs are lost. Things like that happen when the police go too far. Um, and so a civil rights attorney may have a different perspective on this. And so if you think you've been wronged, you should definitely talk with a local civil rights attorney near you, somebody who sues the police uh, for basically going too far. There may be claims, but I think you'd have to have some kind of damages. Damages doesn't mean your car is damaged. Damages means you need to be able to demonstrate the police did X, Y, Z, and it cost me, you know, ABC over here. 
because the police did something, it cost me damages, uh, either property damage, physical damage, maybe emotional damage. I'm not sure you can recover from that in these scenarios, but maybe they cost you their, your job because they, uh, you know, kind of tarnish your reputation, for example. That could be good damages for a civil rights lawsuit. Um, this is a great question, and this is one we're going to handle a little bit later on the channel for sure, because this is coming soon uh, to, I think, every police department. How to handle DRE eval. For people who don't know, DRE is a drug recognition expert, and I'm going to put expert in air quotes because I think it's junk. Um, essentially, DRE is a sort of a more advanced version of field sobriety tests. Everybody's familiar with the standardized field sobriety tests you've seen on TV or movies where you stand on one leg, you walk the line, you uh, you know maybe do the finger dexterity where you count one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one, that kind of stuff. Those are the standardized field sobriety tests. Well, this is not standardized, this is junk. Um, but the one leg stand, the nine step walk and turn and the horizontal gaze nystagmus where you follow the pin with your eye. Those are the standardized field sobriety tests. And those have been studied and found to actually show impairment depending on if they're done accurately. Anyway, off topic. A DRE is a drug recognition expert, and essentially this is a new training that's coming about. I'm seeing in a lot of places locally. Uh, the state police have them. A couple of my local counties where I practice have them. And these are officers who are specially trained to be able to do other tests and be able to do other analyses of people's eyes, face, and body movements to be able to determine if they're under the influence of drugs. And not only that, but what drugs they're under the influence of. And I'm sorry, but... I, a lot of these officers work really hard and, you know, I'm not going to throw them under the bus, but I frankly don't trust that a lot of these average officers are able to be able to determine not only that you're under the influence of something, but what class of drugs you may be under the influence of just based on your eye movements and whatnot. So we're going to definitely have some issues, uh, some discussion about that on the channel later on. Be sure to subscribe uh, for a new video every Tuesday. Uh, we're going to skip March 1st just because the vacation's gotten away. So it's hard to get everything filmed and edited. Um, but most every Tuesday, we try to put up a new video. So be sure to subscribe. And we'll be talking about DRE later. I'm going to make a note right now because that's a great topic. Okay. Here's a good question from Nathan Keller. Correct me if I'm wrong, unless you have tinted window, you can half roll your windows down. This gets back to the rolling the window down. What's the point? What, what purpose are you serving? I just don't recommend it. Uh, to me, if you're being pulled over, the officer under Pennsylvania versus MIMS can absolutely require you to get out of the car. That's just all there is to it. So what's the point of of only half rolling down your window. I just think it's, it's silly, frankly. Uh, you, people will be much better off by not talking. That's where people do wrong. Not so much rolling the window down, it's that people talk and people talk themselves into a DUI arrest or talk themselves into a ticket, things like that. Uh, it, you'd be doing much better to just get ingrained in your head, not to answer police questions, not, not to talk to the police. And if they pressure you, just say, I'm sorry, an attorney friend of mine told me I shouldn't answer questions. I'm your friend and I'm an attorney. All right, let's see. Exactly how long is the reasonable traffic stop? That is standard traffic stop or simple tickets are written. This is a great question, but I need a sip of water. Okay, this is a great question. And I need to add this to my list too. Um, so essentially there are cases in uh, so the Supreme Court, so this applies to all people everywhere in the country. There are cases that explain what the uh, what an officer is allowed to do during a traffic stop. Essentially, they're allowed, you know, if they stop you for maybe running a stop sign or whatever, they're allowed to uh, investigate, obviously, the original reason for the stop. They're allowed to check the driver to see if the driver's got a valid license, also to see if the driver has any outstanding warrants. Um, and then essentially, they're either supposed to issue a warning or a summons, uh, which is a ticket, and the driver's supposed to be released and on their way. And if they deviate from that those kind of specific inquiries, if they deviate, they have to be able to support that deviation with other justifications. So basically other reasonable suspicion or probable cause, there's something else going on here. So this uh, was a big deal in Virginia uh, up to until a couple of years ago when marijuana got decriminalized, when frankly, there was lots of marijuana cases coming through the general district courts in Virginia for people just minor possession of marijuana, but it suspended your license for six months. It's a big deal or was a big deal. And it probably still is a big deal in a lot of states. And so there was a lot of marijuana enforcement getting that terrible devil's lettuce off the roadways. And 
essentially, uh, there was a lot of issues with the, the canines being called out and officers prolonging their traffic stops while they're waiting on a canine to do a sniff to determine if they can search the vehicle or not. And so we had a lot of challenges to this. There's a Virginia or a United States Supreme Court case called uh, Rodriguez. Uh, and Rodriguez is a, exactly about that issue. Rodriguez goes into the standards uh, of basically how long is too long uh, to hold somebody waiting on your canine to arrive. And essentially, there is no set time. There is no standard in the law that says the officers have 10 minutes to do a speeding ticket or 15 minutes to do a DUI investigation. There's no such thing. It is all based on the facts and the circumstances of the individual case. And so that's where, unfortunately, there's a lot of room to argue. And the standard is very low for the comp for the uh, state or the prosecutor to meet. As long as the officers are reasonably diligently pursuing the legal things, it's going to be an OK stop. But I frankly have had several cases recently where officers are literally just standing there, standing there waiting on somebody to come with some other piece of equipment or something, you know, like a handheld breath test for a DUI investigation. And they literally tell the client on video, yeah, we're just waiting for my partner to get here. You know, and is that reasonable? No, not at that point. This is still what we'd call a Terry stop. It still needs to be a brief detention and it's not reasonable at that point. I would say in general for a re just a regular like speeding ticket type stop, you're talking 10 to 15 minutes for the officer to do their job. Now the, the time frame is going to change depending upon if they have to hand write their tickets or if they have an e-summons. A lot of jurisdictions now, they can simply scan your driver's license, they key in what kind of ticket they wanna issue and it literally prints out on a little printer. And so if they can do it that way, it should be pretty quick to check your license, scan it, you know, call it in a dispatch maybe, make sure your vehicle's properly registered and print out a ticket. How long does that really take? You know, under 10 minutes maybe? So that's a, it's a very difficult analysis, but that's kind of the way it works. All right. So I'm missing a lot of questions. We got a lot of uh, we got a lot of people showing up, and it's awesome. <laughs> Here's Chris. You're on live chat. I love your videos, and those bow ties are pimp. I appreciate it, Chris. Not everybody appreciates a good bow tie. All right, people people got to realize these bow ties. They're where it's at. Here's a good question from uh, Richard Richard, or a statement rather. They walk up with an attitude and dare you to question their authority. Yes and no. All right. I see a lot of body camera videos and dash camera videos from my clients. In every DUI case, we I watch whatever video is available. You know, it's a high stakes case and we got to watch the video. And frankly, a lot of times the videos show that the officer's version of what happened is not what we're seeing on the video. Um, and sometimes, yes, there are some officers, frankly, who I know personally, who I see routinely on video and I hear from clients, you know, they had this attitude, this, you know, us versus them kind of mentality. And that happened a lot. Does it happen every time? No. And is it even most of the time? Frankly, no, it's not. Um, so just keep that in mind. I, I know officers get a bad rap in a lot of times, and I'm not here to defend all officers everywhere, but I am here to point out that they have a hard job and don't assume they're going to come up with an attitude. Because if you have that, those uh, rose color, those uh, lenses over your eyes, you may see an attitude when they're really not trying to show an attitude. That's just my only little tip there. Sometimes they do. Absolutely. I see it. I see it every day sometimes, uh, but sometimes they don't. And sometimes they're just trying to kind of do a hard job. And, you know, you know, sometimes people need tickets, unfortunately. Uh, here's a great ticket uh, back on to the bow ties. How do you organize and store your bow ties? Um, I actually don't own that many bow ties. I need to expand my collection, but I have these little uh, tie racks in our master closet. It's this little metal bar and it's got these little plastic clips. And so you can clip uh, bow ties or regular neckties in them. So I have a couple that have plenty of room for regular long ties. And then I have one where I guess pretty wide and it holds all my bow ties. Uh, so anyway, there we have it. Uh, Dinesh asks, is it ever advisable to consent to a search of myself or auto? No, 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 never, ever consent. Why? What's the point, right? If an officer says, hey, you, do you have any contraband in your vehicle? Do you mind if I search? Well, what's the point? If the officer believes there's contraband in the vehicle, that is probable cause to search. He can search without your permission, no problem. Uh, if he's truly got a reason, an actual probable cause reason to believe that there's contraband in the vehicle. If he doesn't have a reason to search, well, he's not gonna be able to search unless you allow him to search. And if if you know there's nothing in the vehicle, why allow him to tear your vehicle apart and find nothing and delay you longer? 
And if you think there may be something in the vehicle, why would you want to incriminate yourself by allowing him to search? There's just no good reason here. There's no good reason to allow an officer to search your person or your vehicle. Now, if the officer says, okay, Mr. Nenish, step out of the vehicle, we're going to search. That's different, right? They can, like, under Pennsylvania versus MIMS, they can require you out of the vehicle and you need to comply with that order. And if they're going to search, search. Don't say anything. Don't say, okay, yeah, you can go ahead and search. Just step out, stand where they tell you to stand, and they'll do their thing. And then if they find something, then your, you and your attorney can analyze whether or not there was a valid reason to do the search in the first place. So it's never advisable to consent. It, just, it doesn't help you. It only helps the police. All right. So uh, M. Christensen says one odd question. If police need a warrant to search your home, what happens if your home is your vehicle? Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Um, yes, the police need a warrant to search your house, except for there's exigent circumstances. There's a whole, whole bunches of exceptions to the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is like Swiss cheese these days. OK, but in general, they need a warrant for your home, but not a vehicle. The big rationale is not so much that you live there. The rationale is that it's immobile. The home isn't going to just pick up and go somewhere if the police have to go get a warrant and come back in half an hour, right? But a vehicle could just disappear, right? I mean, it really can. It could disappear very quickly if the police, you know, have to go get a warrant or something. And that's essentially the reason why they don't need a warrant for a vehicle. The vehicle exception to the Fourth Amendment, there's lots of exceptions to the Fourth Amendment, unfortunately. All right. Uh, add state and ass. Are driver's license checkpoints legal? Allegheny County does. Oh, Allegheny County. So I don't know. So does this frequently. Um, yes, they're legal. OK, unfortunately, yes. Uh, I've got a whole video on that on driver's license checkpoints. And essentially, uh, there's a whole standard that they have to meet um, about whether I think of the factors off the top of my head. I haven't seen one in a while. I guess Stafford and Spotsylvania County in Virginia don't do them very much anymore. But essentially, the checkpoint has to be neutral. It, it has to be pre-approved ahead of time. And the normal policy is you're going to have some kind of like sergeant approve the checkpoint like the day before. And you're going to have a couple other deputies or troopers go out and do it, you know, without the sergeant there. So it's kind of there's kind of a dis, uh, disconnect between the person who approved it and the people who do it. Uh, the checkpoint plan has to state kind of the time, the date, the location and what the plan is. Are we going to stop every single car? Are we going to stop every third car? What happens if we get a backup of 20 cars? Are we going to just stop? Are we going to let them all through and then start checking people? The whole point behind the rules for checkpoints is that the, the, the courts that have all analyzed this, the Supreme Court allows it, uh, most states allow it. I think there are some states that have very specific rules on it, but in general, they're allowed. And the whole point is we want to make sure that individual officers, you know, Officer Andy is not going to say, hey, I know that John Smith works at the Burger King and he's getting off work and I think he doesn't have a valid license. So let's set up a checkpoint right outside of his work tonight. You know, they don't want that kind of thing. And I think we all agree that shouldn't be allowed. Now, to what degree should checkpoints be allowed? I think we a lot of us disagree. Uh, I personally think they're garbage. I have a whole video on how they essentially uh, don't really find the violations they're supposed to be finding. Uh, you know, a lot of checkpoints that I've reviewed, the plans, they have a plan ahead of time, then they have like an after action report that says, we did this checkpoint on this date and this time, and we found XYZ violations. And you'll see they stop, you know, like 100 cars, 200 cars, whatever, over a course of an hour. And they literally find like one unlicensed driver and maybe one DUI. So we've stopped all these citizens um, and detained them and infringed upon their liberty. And we found one minor violation, maybe. I just, it doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Oh, and an ad state and clarified Allegheny County Sheriff's Office. Thank you. Okay. And we have a hi, Mr. Fluji. Hey, Jonathan. I'm glad you stopped by. Okay. Um, we're let's talk a little bit about the law that came uh, that was a not approved in Virginia. So the whole point of this video uh, was supposed to be about um, how. Um, do the officer does the officer have to tell you why he stopped you? There's a bill in Virginia where essentially uh, I'm going to try to share that tab. Um, let me see if I can share. I'm trying to make sure I got the right tab. Yep. All right. So there's a bill in Virginia right here. Uh, that's Senate Bill number 34. I hope you can see it. And that. That bill essentially was to require, no, I'm sorry, I'm, got, I'm sharing the wrong one. Pardon me. 
I'm pretty tech savvy, but this is kind of hard to talk on a video and share stuff on the screen. All right, so here's the bill. Senate bill number 246. This bill essentially did one little thing. You can see the highlighted portion. I don't know if it's big enough to read on your screen, but this bill essentially, this is the law in Virginia that says, if you're pulled over by the police, you have to show them your driver's license registration. Pretty much every law, every state has some kind of similar law. Uh, to basically show your ID when you're driving a vehicle. Now, identification laws are all different, um, and but when you're driving a vehicle on the highway in Virginia, you have to identify yourself if stopped by law enforcement. What this bill did, uh, it attempted to do, was it said basically on the officer's request, and the highlighted portion is, and upon being advised of the purpose of the stop within a reasonable time, only then do you have to exhibit your registration card, et cetera. So basically, it was requiring that if a police officer pulls you over, they have some decent stop, fine. They have to tell you what the stop is for. And only then are you required to provide your identif identification and your registration. Well, I'm here to tell you the bill failed. OK, um, the bill failed. And what I would imagine proponents would claim uh, or sorry, people who oppose the bill would claim is that this hurts officer safety. Um, essentially, what they're probably worried about is that let's say, uh, you know, John T. Felon is driving down the road and he's got a warrant out for a felony and the officer pulls him over for a taillight out or something simple. And the officer thinks you might be John T. Felon, um, but he's got a good reason to pull him over. And if he said, oh, Mr. Felon, you've got a warrant for your arrest. That's why I'm detaining you. Um, and then, you know, this is going to give the driver an incentive to try to run something like that. And I think that's kind of the, the concern that the opponents of that bill would have. Um, I frankly don't share that concern. I think it's not unreasonable for an officer within a reasonable period of time. I mean, it's, you know, within a reasonable period of time is not that, you know, gives quite a little, a lot of latitude where an officer can maybe claim it wasn't reasonable to tell this guy, you know, what was going on. Um, anyway, I think it gives a lot of leeway for officer safety. And I think it's a simple bill that just added a few words to the code that I think should have passed. Unfortunately, it didn't and it failed. While we're talking about uh, that same statute, and I was finding that bill, I found uh, this other bill that's actually quite uh, quite interesting that I wanted to share. Uh, you know, in Virginia, you, like I was saying, you have to show your license and registration when you're pulled over. This bill, uh, Senate Bill 34, is going along. What this bill does is it actually, uh, it's the same section, 462-104. And what this bill does is it actually says that the DMV may issue electronic registration cards. If you look down here, uh, DMV may issue an electronic registration card. But for people who think your electronic registration card is going to be enough to satisfy law enforcement, think again. The bill essentially allows electronic registration cards, but it says that's not enough. You still need to carry your little piece of paper in your car in Virginia. It just, it just kind of blows the mind that in this day and age, uh, when we're actually you know, adding laws to allow for electronic registration cards, why don't we say, if you can pull your registration card up on your phone, that that's sufficient? Why do you need to have a piece of paper that the officer can take to his cruiser or something? It just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. All right. Let's go back to a couple of questions. Uh, let me get a sip of water here real quick. All right. Uh, P. Will for real ask, can a cop come inside my house if they do not have a search warrant, but do have an arrest warrant while I'm in the house? Yes. Um, a search, so warrants for the house are very complicated. Um, your, your home is your castle, and that is where you have the most Fourth Amendment protection on the face of the planet is in your home. Okay. However, it's not unlimited. The police do have certain uh, abilities to come in your home. Um, a search warrant obviously lets them come into the property to search for things. Right. That's what the search warrant's all about. But it has to be for things that are uh, on the search warrant. So if they're searching for, let's say they're looking for a stolen tractor um, and they have a search warrant to come search your farm for the stolen tractor, that would limit where they can go. Right. I mean, in theory, they shouldn't be allowed to go in the bedroom where the tractor wouldn't fit, uh, but they could go in the barn and the garage and places like that. So a search warrant. An arrest warrant allows them to search for the person so they can arrest the person, but they can also look for the person but they have to have reason to believe the person is on those premises. So they can't just come in um, and just say, maybe he's here. They gotta be able to justify why they believe he's here. So if it's a search warrant for you and it's at your residence address where you're known to live and your car's out in the driveway or they can see it you know, in the garage window or something, that would probably be a good reason to come in your house. 
Apparently, I'm being drafted to uh, get a North Carolina law license. I don't know that I want to have a North Carolina North Carolina law license, but if somebody wants to help uh, help me get licensed in Texas, that might be fun. I've still got family back there. <laughs> um, all right. Scott Duke asks, when declining to answer questions or consent to a search, do you have to appeal directly to specific amendments or rights for it to be official? No, but yes. <laughs> this is going back to getting to maybe. Um, in general, no. In general, what you should just do is just say no. If you're being asked to search, just say no thanks. Uh, if you're being asked questions, just don't even reply. You don't have to always say something. That's kind of this, people like to fill the gap. That's a common interrogation technique. It's a common sales technique as well, is to just be, you know, for the other person to be quiet. And we naturally want to fill dead space. And so we start talking. That's where you got to overcome that urge, bite your tongue, bite your cheek, something, and just be quiet. You don't have to say anything. I've had clients who, you know, were trying, I've watched videos from DUIs or something, and they're really trying to not incriminate themselves and not answer questions. But then they just start to keep talking and keep running their mouth. And it, it frankly looks even worse sometimes uh, when they just keep running their mouth. Um, it, the claim is you're drunk and you kind of are talking like a drunk person would talk, even though you're not really admitting to drinking, for example. Um, so you don't, you definitely don't have to cite specific amendments or code sections or anything like that. I, now, the one exception is the Fifth Amendment. Um, there is a case, um, I can't remember the site offhand, but there is a case where essentially uh, a person's refusal to answer a question was allowed to be used in evidence against them because they were basically being interrogated by the police. They were cooperating, talking, answering all these questions. And then all of a sudden, the police kind of got to the key point about, you know, did you kill so-and-so or did you hold a murder weapon or whatever the question was? And the person clammed up, just stopped talking. And so the court, if I remember the case correctly, the court essentially said because they didn't specifically invoke their Fifth Amendment rights um, and say, I'm actually invoking the Fifth Amendment now, um, the, the basically the, the fact that they were talking and answering questions, and then when they got to this certain question, they didn't respond, that was allowed to be used in evidence against them, even though it shouldn't be because it's your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So that's the one, uh, the one time when I think it would be advisable to when you want to remain silent to specifically say, I plead the fifth or I invoke the fifth and just stop talking. That's all there is to it. I invoke the fifth and zip your lip. Here's a good question from MH08. Who wants to hand their phone over to an officer? It's a good point back on the registration cards, right? The same thing with insurance cards. This is why I definitely recommend to have paper copies. In Virginia, you got to have your paper registration card, probably in a lot of states. A lot of people don't have paper insurance cards, uh, but I think it's advisable. And frankly, it's just easier, right? I always recommend you have an envelope that's clearly labeled uh, that has all your important documents and only the current documents. Don't have five years of expired documents in there. You got to search through. Can I tell you how many DUIs I've seen where some of the factors of impairment were that the person had to search for five minutes to find their registration card. It should be as simple as popping the glove box, grabbing one envelope and hand it to the officer. And he may say, oh, I just need your registration. Can you get that out of there? Okay, then you open it up and find your registration and hand it to him. Or keep it in your visor or your console, somewhere that's just ready to go um, and there's no question, right? All right. Here's another question. Let's see, we have one from Frozen Trichrome. Quick question. Let's say cops come to my house wanting to talk and I tell them, no thanks, can you please leave? How long do they have to leave the property? Um, I'd say that's it, right? Unless they have some kind of reason to believe there's something going on um, where they have a search warrant or something, you've told them to leave. Um, I have a great video about the police in your backyard. You should check that out. It's from a few weeks ago where essentially the police, just like anybody else, can walk up to your front door and ring your doorbell. I could come ring your doorbell right? Uh, assuming you don't have a big fence or no trespassing sign, which you should, but assuming you don't have that, um, I can come up with the sidewalk and ring your doorbell. Um, if the police do that and they say, hey, we want to talk to you about X, Y, Z, and you say, no, thanks, please leave. You close the door. They need to leave, right? They've been asked to leave your property. Now they're no longer welcome. They're no longer guests that are welcome there. Now, will they leave right away? Maybe not. Maybe they'll ring the doorbell again. At that point, I would ignore them. If they keep ringing the doorbell, I would potentially, I would consider calling the police on themselves and say, I've got officers at my door. I don't want to talk to them. Please have them removed. You know, now they may not move right away. And so you may have a further escalation or further problem, but they should leave soon. 
This is one reason you also may want to consider surveillance at your house. So you could prove how long they were there. You could prove that you did uh, state that you wanted them to leave, et cetera. This is another area where there may not be much recourse, assuming they don't do anything. They just hang out and try to get you to talk. Assuming you know you don't talk, there may not be much recourse if they wait for 10 minutes. Uh, but they should, they should leave if you ask them to. All right, here's another uh, great topic we're not going to cover today because it is a lot of issues. But Sonny asks, what are your views or thoughts on civil asset forfeiture? It's horrible. It should be gone. It should be abolished. OK, it's horrible. Uh, the whole concept that just because I'm driving along with some cash means the police can assume I'm a drug dealer or it's from, you know, some uh, criminal enterprise is insane. I, I mean, frankly, I'm a lawyer. People pay cash a lot. I mean, we accept a lot of money not by cash, but I mean, people pay cash for things. You know, I have a friend who does a lot of, you know, like uh, uh, a lot of projects for other people and buying and selling things. And a lot of that business is just in cash. So people have cash on hand. And just because you have cash uh, in your vehicle doesn't mean that the police should be able to assume it's some, you know, product of crime and just take it away. And then you've got to prove that it that it was legally obtained. What kind of crazy world are we in that that's a thing? Uh, there was a bunch of issues back, if I recall correctly, in Stafford County here in Virginia, where they basically done civil asset forfeiture wrong and essentially kind of rammed through the system and, you know, didn't even sign the paperwork correctly. And so some of that was able to be un unwound. The other big issue I have with it is, why should the police who are going around seizing assets from people, they shouldn't be able to personally, their departments shouldn't be able to personally profit from that money. If we think this is a good thing, if we think that we need to take this money out of the hands of criminals, well, the money shouldn't end up in the police and the prosecutor's hands. That gives them too much of a bias and an incentive to find money uh, that needs to be taken. If, if we're gonna allow this, at at least the money should be going simply into like in Virginia, we have the literary fund, which helps fund education and reading and whatnot. It should be going somewhere like that into like the literary fund or, you know, poor people's college fund or something, nothing to do with policing. Um, that's just a horrible, horrible conflict of interest that we need to get rid of. All right, let's see if we have maybe one or two more questions and here we go. Throwaway Throwaway says, smash that thumbs up, please. Certainly helps if you subscribe, give us a thumb up, share it, and just be sure to subscribe. I try to do a new video every Tuesday is the plan. All right. Here's David back to civil asset forfeiture. I pay cash. I don't use credit cards. See, a lot of people still deal in cash. Uh, I personally don't like dealing in cash just because it's, I feel clumsy doing it. I just, and it makes my wallet too thick. I have one of these little thin wallets that I like. Um, let's see. All right, Esteban asks, what if the police say is a lawful order, open the door without a warrant? I assume we're maybe talking about your house. Um, the police can't make you open your door without a warrant at your house. So I would just say no. And frankly, I would go to another room of the house. One thing people don't think about is you don't have to engage with people, right? The police may come in your home uninvited without a warrant. You can't stop them, okay? I mean, that's a whole other topic of whether or not you can repel an illegal police uh, entry into your home. You can certainly, to a degree, depending on your state, you can repel an illegal arrest uh, with an appropriate degree of force. But do you really want to fight that issue? It's much easier if the police are knocking and you don't want to talk, but you shouldn't unless they're coming to help you for some reason. You know you called them and you need help, okay? But if they're not coming to help you or help a neighbor uh, that you want to help, Go to another room of the house, you know, let them knock. Fine. Go to another room of the house, put on earbuds, whatever you got to do. You know, that, that's what I would do, frankly, um, is just don't engage. Walk away. All right. A boring sandwich. I like your name. Theft is wrong whether the cops do it or the IRS does it or the local county assessor does it. Taxation is theft. Civil, assets, civil asset forfeiture is theft. You know what? I just got my new uh, tax assessments for our house. And I'm, I'm feeling that. I'm feeling a boring sandwich. Taxation is definitely a, a problem, <laughs> a big problem. I really think if more people personally had to write a check for their tax bill, whether it's your income tax or your property tax or whatever it is, if you had to see the bill and write the check, our tax rates would drop. Like just they would plummet like a stone. Uh, that's my two cents on tax rates. All right. And here's, we're gonna finish with a couple of fun questions. Uh, the Bubble 85 says, are you good at darts? The dartboard might make you think that I'm good at darts, but I'm really not. <laughs> I, 
I, I try to play darts a little bit between phone calls some days. I'm on the phone pretty much all afternoon in court pretty much all morning. And uh, I'm not great at darts, but I'm getting there. I'm getting there. All right. <laughs> Here's another rolling down. I'm going to have to make a whole video on rolling down the windows. Ronald asked, how far do you get down? Do you have to roll your window and being stopped by the police? Do you have to roll it on the passenger side too? I was told that cops do this to get a cross breach to search for drugs. I honestly never thought about the uh, passenger side trying to get, you know, breeze coming through the window. Uh, that, that actually makes a lot of sense if I'm an officer, um, but I don't think you have to roll down the passenger side. In fact, I don't think you have to, I, I really don't see you have to do that. Um, we talked about this earlier, so you may want to go back and watch it. I don't think it serves you by rolling your window halfway down. I think that kind of gets the whole encounter off on the wrong foot. I just don't recommend it. Oh, and here we go. Chris K says, you do realize your two cents on taxes is taxable, right? Yes, sadly, sadly, sadly. All right. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, Boondocks asks, are you a fan of the lawyer show Suits? I don't think I've ever actually seen an episode of Suits. Um, I, we tend to watch not a lot of current TV because, frankly, I'm a fairly conservative guy, and a lot of TV is pretty trashy these days. Um, so we watch some sci-fi and some older TV and read. You know, I'm trying to get really into reading. I got a Kindle a little while back, and it's a really great, uh, really great investment if you don't have a Kindle to try to read more. We, we should all read more and watch less TV. I'm not trying to lecture you, but I've not seen Suits. Um, let's see. Uh, do, you, do I need to notify an officer if I have a taser in my glove box? I wouldn't think so. Um, you have to check your state. Your state may have rules about concealed uh, weapons. Um, so you, you may have an issue with having a taser in your glove box. Uh, I have to check the Virginia statute actually to see if a taser qualifies as a concealed weapon. Um, in Virginia, you can't have any kind of concealed weapon without a proper permit for it, of course. Um, and that would include, you know, knives of certain lengths and things like that. And I think a taser probably would qualify. Um, so you probably don't want to notify uh, the officer if you have a taser in your glove box. It's probably a bad idea. You might be, you might be inviting yourself to, uh, to be uh, charged with an offense for carrying a concealed weapon. I'm not saying you should have one, but um, volunteering that information might not be a good idea. Uh, I had another comment I wanted to talk about. Here we go. Better call Saul. Uh, never seen it either, <laughs> but that's a great one. Great, great. Um, let's see. I think we're about it. I appreciate everybody coming. Um, oh, I was going to talk about this. The Arrest Proof Yourself. Um, one of my favorite podcasts. I'm going to put a plug in right now for Radical Personal Finance. If you haven't watched, listen to it. You need to watch, listen to it. Radical Personal Finance talks about Arrest Proof Yourself. He's got a couple of great episodes where he talks about this kind of stuff. Um, and, um, it's good stuff. I haven't read the book personally, but I need to, I need to put it on my reading list. Um, anyway, I think it's a good, uh, good thing to think about how we can all try to stay immune from arrests. And the last one, cause I do have meetings I got to get to, uh, Raymond says audiobooks are where it's at. I agree, Raymond. I listen to audiobooks in the car and I try to read on the Kindle. I listen to a lot of podcasts like radical personal finance guys. I really appreciate you coming. I do please hope to you'll subscribe, tell a friend, um, and please uh, hit the bell so you can be notified when I go live. I'm trying, trying to do a live like maybe once a month, and we're trying to do a video every Tuesday uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern. I hope, appreciate you coming by. If you have any questions, just drop them in the comments later, and we'll try to maybe do another Q&A soon. Take care. Everybody have a great day.